Good morning. Welcome to God's house here at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church this morning. Uh, it's great to have a chance to be with you as we uh, praise our God together and also for those joining us online uh, that they're able to also come praise our God together with us from afar this morning. Uh, so it's great to be with you. Our, our service today is this theme that we're doing once a month uh, for three months. So this is the second one, and this is this God-lived life. And the idea of this is that we think about how we live our faith in different areas of our lives. Uh, we, we talked last time about a, a God-lived life with our time in the Word. Um, this was last month in September. We talked about uh, how we want to prioritize having God speak to us in His Word. And today, we're thinking about a God-lived life when it comes to serving others. Uh, we know Jesus in His ministry, of course, served others, and He calls on us to do the same. And there's some things that we, we do to serve you know, where we don't get super close to a person, you know, you, you might give money uh, to help someone far away. Uh, but today we're going to think even especially about serving others where we try to get close to them and connect to their lives. And we're going to see Jesus do that uh, as he shares a meal with a group of people that he wasn't expected to share a meal with, uh, as he showed hospitality and service to people. And, and we're going to think about how we serve others uh, in their lives and try to connect them to the same Savior that we have. So that's going to be the focus of our worship today. Uh, the, the service will be uh, in the service folder. It'll be on the screen uh, as well. The, this particular um, order of service is not in the hymnal, but the hymns you'll be able to find in the hymnal if you'd like to do that. Uh, so with that, we'll begin with our opening hymn. Please stand.
And you may be seated. Our God speaks to us in his word this morning, first of all, from the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 9. Uh, and here in the, this part of the early Christian church, we see, first of all, God's power because God allows Peter to raise someone from the dead. So that'd be amazing enough. But the person that he raises from the dead, her name is Tabitha, and in her we see an example of someone who served others. And you know, they were, they were sad because she had died and all the service that she had done for them. And obviously they were happy when then she was raised from the dead. But the reminder for us is that those acts of service can really affect people. And God can use that to help us get into people's lives and again, help us point them to him. So we read from Acts chapter 9. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please, come at once. Peter went with them. And when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. The word of the Lord. And now we have a song from our fifth and sixth graders, so I invite them uh, to come up and for their song.
you're in control. Our God speaks to us in his word again, this time from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 9, or I'm sorry, chapter 4, beginning with verse 9. And there, you know, Paul's telling the people that he's writing to, to keep serving God, but it's not like they weren't doing it already. They were already serving God. In fact, he's commending him for that. And I just like the encouragement he has for them. He says, keep doing that and do it more and more. Because that's the encouragement for us. It's not that, we're hearing today to serve God, you know, because we're not doing it necessarily. But it's a reminder that's something that we always strive for in our life because of the Savior that served us. Uh, because he gave his life for us, we want to live for him and serve others. We read here from 1 Thessalonians 4. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel for today is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 9, and this will also serve as the basis for the sermon today. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Congregation may be seated. And at this time, I invite any children who wish to come forward to the, the, the carpet here. Uh, for a brief children's message. All right, we got a few brave people. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody today. Um, I, so I brought something today that I have in my office at, here at church. It's sitting on my desk, um, but I, don't, I haven't showed it to people very much. Um, but I'm wondering if anyone can tell what is happening in this little carving. All right, so there's two people. 
So you can either guess who the people are, or you can tell me what's happening here in this little thing. Uh, yes, what do you think? I think Jesus is washing someone's feet. Yeah, Jesus, so that's, that's this guy, right? Um, Jesus is washing someone's feet, right? So you can see the guy's foot, foot is out there. Anybody know who, who, the, who the person's foot he's washing? This, this would be kind of hard. Uh, but his name is Peter, right? And that's one of Jesus' disciples. And so why do you think Jesus is washing someone's foot? Why do you think he would do that? It might seem a little strange. What do you think, Henry? It's a sign of forgiveness because he's washing their feet. All right, sign of forgiveness. Um, and we know, of course, that, that Jesus came to forgive us. Uh, so we could definitely think of that. Uh, and we can also think of the fact... Now, Normally, when you go to someone's house, does someone at their house wash your feet for you? Yeah, that doesn't happen very often uh, today. Back then, everybody wore sandals, right? And, you know, it's getting colder now a little bit, and so I don't see, you know, no one here is wearing sandals, at least who came, who came forward. Uh, but they would be in places that are all dusty. And so it was common back then to wash someone's feet, uh, but it was usually the servant's. Like, they would have servants sometimes, and it would be the servant's job to wash their feet. And would, would you normally think, you know, would Jesus act as a servant for his disciples and wait on them? And yeah, we, don't, we don't usually think of him doing that because he's Jesus, right? He, uh, he came as the Savior of the world, but he was willing to do that. And then Jesus said, now, this isn't the part that the sermon's on today, but it, it's really similar because... Jesus said, you know, Jesus talked about himself as the Son of Man. He said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. So he's saying he came to help people. Um, yes, by washing their feet, but mostly, like you talked about forgiveness, by dying on the cross for them. But Jesus calls on us, not necessarily to, to wash people's feet, although if that was still a thing, I suppose we could, but Jesus wants us to serve others too. And he wants us to help others. He doesn't want us to think of, oh, helping others sounds... Sounds gross. Like, washing someone's feet might not sound super fun, and maybe it's not. Um, I don't know. Uh, but serving others, you know, sometimes you might feel, oh, I don't want to help someone else. I got enough problems. I want someone to help me. You know, I want someone to make me food and give me stuff. Uh, I don't want to help others. But Jesus reminds us, help other people. Look to serve others. And the reason we want to do that is because Jesus served us. And he showed his love for us, and that's why we want to show that love to others. So that's the reminder when we see Jesus washing someone's feet to, for us to think about how we can serve people too. All right, let's pray and thank God. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus uh, who came to this world not to be served by others, even though he could have, uh, because he's God. Uh, he, in a way, everyone should serve Jesus, but instead he came to serve us and to not only wash people's feet, but to die on the cross to pay for their sins. And Lord, because of what Jesus did, help us to want to serve others. Help us to look for ways that we can help other people. Um, to give thanks to you for how much you love us, help us show that thanks by helping others. Lord, we can only do this by your power and strength, and we pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks so much, you guys. Uh, you guys can go back to your seats. And we will continue then with our next hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, can you picture the scene of, if I can show it here, walking into a lunchroom when you're a new student? Right? So you can picture, you know, trying to balance your tray. You know, there's drinks, there's a bunch of food on there. And then you're walking to a bunch of tables. A lot of the tables are full, and you don't know anybody in this lunchroom. Think about what that feels like. There's always the thought, is someone going to want to let me sit by them? Uh, are people going to, you know, sort of say, although, you know, I was saving the spot for someone else, seats taken, sort of thing. Uh, and what are people going to think of me if I sit down by them? Or what are people going to think of me if I don't sit down by them and I sit down by myself? Then will they think, oh, you know, this is someone who's going to sit and eat lunch by themselves. Will other people come and sit by me if I sit by myself? And you can think of sort of the, the mental agony that someone goes through, and it's all in the process of them walking through this lunchroom, trying to balance their tray, and, and sort of feeling like an outsider. And, and maybe you've been in that situation, and maybe you remember that situation. Of course, if it was a movie, you know, it'd be even worse than that. There, you know, each table would be filled with a different stereotype uh, of, of kid, you know, from that age. You know, people would be throwing things at them, probably if it was a movie, they'd be trying to trip them. Uh, but even without all that sort of extra movie stuff, it, it's a hard situation. And then also sometimes the, the people sitting at the other tables have the same thoughts in their head. Like, well, should we let someone sit with us? But what will people think of us if we let this person sit? Or what will people think of us if we don't let this person sit with us? And it's just this, this weird thing people go through. The thing is, it's not just for you know, high school or grade school or whatever, whatever age it is that you do that. We don't ever completely grow out of this. That awkward feeling of, you know, when do we let people in or when don't we? Or that, that feeling of being an outsider in different situations. Uh, that's kind of something that stays with us throughout our lives in this world because we're in a sinful world. Uh, but maybe we recognize that when you've been in that situation, whether it's in a lunchroom or someone else, where you felt like the outsider, how nice it is when someone does kind of let you in, right? And we're thinking about that today because Jesus kind of caught some flack from some other people because of who Jesus ate with. And they didn't like the fact that Jesus was, and our theme for today, he was eating with sinners. Uh, but what Jesus was doing, uh, he was going to a group of people who felt like outsiders. And he came not to, to join them in their sin. You know, we'll talk about what kind of sinners they were and what kind of sinners we are, you know, as we think about this today. But Jesus came to do that to point them to himself and, and to show them his love. And then Jesus invites us to show that same love to others and to point other people to the love that we have in our Savior. So we're going to think about that today. As Jesus was eating with sinners, you know, what does that mean for us? Um, and what opportunities do we have also of eating with sinners? So to do this, we're, we're looking at that gospel lesson. I just read a couple of moments ago. Uh, but here we see the, the calling of the, of the disciples. And you know, if we know Jesus and if we've, we're familiar with the, the stories in the gospel, you know, well, Jesus had 12 disciples, and maybe we take it for granted, but to think about Jesus didn't, you know, hold some sort of contest to find the best disciples possible, you know, you know, where people would submit their resumes and, you know, they'd have to go through a lengthy interview process, you know, that we picture for a job. He went up to people and said, all right, hey, follow me. Be one of my disciples. And... and Again, from our perspective, we would say well, Jesus didn't always choose necessarily the best and brightest. Um, he went to regular people. Uh, common of the disciples are, are fishermen. Uh, that was their job. And, and Jesus and fishermen weren't a bad thing. Uh, but Jesus went to them and said, be my disciple. It's not that they were, had the, the, the skills or something. Jesus knew that they had the skill to do what he wanted them to do. And here we see Jesus calling another disciple uh, and the one who wrote the, the gospel account of this, Matthew. And Matthew, uh, we'll see, was a tax collector. So this is from the first, first verse of our text. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. 
Now, it's easy for us to take kind of all this for granted and say, okay, yeah, this is when he gets Matthew and, and just sort of go on from there. Uh, but I had mentioned this fairly recently, you know, within the last couple of months, but the idea of a tax collector was a really big deal um, at this time. And I don't even know what to compare it to because, uh, you know, people could joke about an IRS agent or something, you know, oh, you don't want to see that IRS agent, you know, or give you an audit on your taxes sort of thing. But really, the, that's not really a great comparison to a tax collector back then because, just as a reminder, the, the people, you know, in Judea, you know, where Jesus, uh, the Holy Land area, they didn't govern themselves. The Roman Empire had basically, you know, uh, swallowed them up and they had Roman soldiers, you know, leading things. There's eventually, you know, Jesus went to Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor of the area. Uh, and so, you know, their, their nation was occupied by this foreign army, basically. And the Romans wanted to get taxes from people. So they hired, you know, fellow Jews to help get the taxes, which in and of itself, that could be okay. But the way they did it was basically by ripping people off. Now, again, there's jokes here about, well, that's how I feel about my taxes. But no, that's not, that's, not, that's not what we're talking about here. They would literally, and this was sort of understood, they, could, they would take the amount they needed to for tax, and then they could take as much as they wanted besides that and pocket the extra. And so these tax collectors were getting rich off of their fellow countrymen um, at the, you know, in order to help the Romans and make themselves rich. So they were just loathed by people, right? Because they felt like these people are traitors. You know, they've, they're not helping our country. In fact, they're working for the Romans and they're robbing us blind in the process. And a lot of times it was true. So this was seen as the worst of the worst. You know, a, a tax collector is just one of those categories that you don't want to be that, right? But that's who Matthew was. And we just see Jesus go up to him, right? So, and there's just, a, just amazing to think of that, of that position. A couple other things for us to notice here. Uh, Jesus went up to Matthew and called him, you know, to follow him while Matthew was at work. Uh, you know, it says he was in the tax collector's booth. You know, apparently they had some, you know, sort of official stations uh, that they would stand at sometimes. But that's just for us to think about, too, when we're dealing with other people. You know, it's not uncommon for us to deal with people at their at their work, you know, uh, see people at the grocery store, uh, there's someone at the cash register at the gas station, uh, we deal with employees when we're buying things at different times in our lives, and it can be easy for us to see those employees as, well, they're just, they just kind of fade into the background, uh, in fact, we think, well, they're there to make me happy, you know, the customer is always right sort of thing, but Jesus, while this person was at work, you know, saw Matthew as someone to reach out to. And it's just that reminder for us, you know, we can see people even if they have a name tag and they're doing their job, that, that's a person. You know, that's a person that, that Jesus loves as a Savior. And is that an opportunity for us for how we talk to them and how we interact with them? Just a thought that comes up with this verse. But anyway, also then Jesus tells Matthew, follow me. And in the original language, there's actually a difference. If Jesus had said, follow me, like for five minutes, you know, can, can you follow me? I got something for you to see quick. You know, that would have been worded differently here. Um, but the way Jesus said it, it is clear that it was sort of a more permanent situation. Follow me. Like, you've, you've won the internship to be my disciple, uh, even though it wasn't a contest. But I want you to be one of my people. Right? I want you to follow me, learn from me, be my disciple. And he gives that offer to Matthew. And Matthew jumps at it. You know? And there's a lot we don't know here. You know, had Matthew heard Jesus speaking different times? Uh, maybe. Is this the first time Matthew had ever heard of Jesus? I suppose it's possible. We just don't know a lot of the background. Uh, regardless, though, Matthew, God saw fit to make this tax collector one of the 12 disciples. All right, so it makes sense then that Jesus would, would need to get to know his, his new disciples. So we see that here. So while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. All right, so the, you know, there's a new disciple in the group, and so they're going to have dinner at Matthew's house. Nothing super unusual there. Uh, and then so we would think, well, why, why would many tax collectors show up? Um, 
Again, they were outsiders. They were hated by so many people. Uh, so, you know, who are the tax collectors going to associate with? Um, probably other people who are kind of outsiders. Uh, fellow tax collectors, in many cases, might be the only people that would talk to them. You know, would be a fellow tax collector. Uh, so it makes sense that they would be part of the group. And then it just says sinners. And again, we don't know, you know, who this could be. There are times where Jesus had made a group of tax collectors and prostitutes, right? So it's possible um, that, that, that you know, there are prostitutes in the, in the people of sinners. We don't know for sure. Uh, but again, it's probably people that were looked down on. Probably people that, you know, they would say in polite society, you know, we wouldn't want to be seen eating with these people, right? But here Jesus is eating with this group. He's got his disciples there. He's got his new disciple, Matthew, and these tax collectors and sinners who are with him. So here he is eating with sinners, just like we're talking about today. Now, the Pharisees have a thing or two to say about this, as, as we would expect them to, because that's, that's what they tend to do. They're religious leaders, but they didn't like Jesus. They didn't like the popularity that Jesus is getting, so they're always looking for a problem with what Jesus did. But, I don't know, we think about what they say, and we, we might wonder, do they have a point here? Um, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, again, we might say, oh, man, Pharisees are being so judgmental, and they were, absolutely. But, you know, there might be a part of us that says, but do they have a little bit of a point? I mean, eating with someone, you know, it, it seems like not a big deal. You know, we do it all the time. We, we have to eat every day, right? And often we'll eat with our own family, or if we're, you know, out in public, you know, maybe we'll eat with strangers. Or, but it is kind of an intimate thing to sit down with a meal with someone. You know, you can, you can open up about yourself in a different way over food. Um, but the Pharisees, and you can probably guess, they're sort of saying, is Jesus saying he's happy with what they're doing with their lives? Because again, tax collectors really did steal from people. You know, that, isn't just, that wasn't just something that people thought that wasn't true. And, and the other people they were with, I mean, sinners isn't just meant as a, you know, it's not meant to be sinners with scare quotes, right? They're really sinners. Just We are too. The Pharisees didn't necessarily realize that part. But all right, so do they have legitimate concerns? I mean, we can think about Bible passages that do kind of warn us about who we associate with. You know, from, from Psalm 1, you know, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. You know, it's, it's a verse that reminds us, you know, we don't want to go along with what everyone else goes along with who doesn't follow God. Okay, you know, was, was that what Jesus was doing? We'll talk about that. But okay, uh, there's other verses. Uh, 1 Corinthians, um, there's a verse about that that says, do not be misled, bad company corrupts good character. Right, there's sometimes we, we talk about people who fell in with the wrong crowd. Right, we might wonder, okay, sometimes there can be people who, you know, spending a lot of time with them who are, who are pulling you into whatever it is they're doing, you know, and it could be a bad influence, and, and the Bible does call that out. So is that what was happening here with Jesus? And I think it's pretty clearly not the case. All right, now maybe it's obvious, but Jesus wasn't sitting down with these tax collectors for them to say, you know, for Jesus to say, hey guys, tell me about how you're robbing people. This is a great scam. You know, here I am. Here I am. Uh, I don't have my, a place to live. We, we need to live off donations. How can we get in on this action, right? No, that's not what he's doing, right? They're not comparing stories of, you know, who's the most sinful and laughing about it. What they're doing is, here they have an opportunity to see who Jesus is, right? He's not there to encourage them in their sin. He's there to point them to himself, to, to serve them. So no, it's not what the Pharisees thought. It was an opportunity for them to serve, and, and it was an opportunity for Jesus to serve them. Uh, and, and here's how Jesus responds to the Pharisees. You know, and here Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Right? And that's a good point. You know, normally, uh, and some people feel like they have to be almost at death's door before they'll go to the doctor. You know, men are sort of stereotypical with this. You know, I'm fine. I don't need to, 
I don't need to see a doctor, right? Uh, but there is, you know, sometimes you feel like, well, when I'm sick, that's when you need a doctor. It always feels weird to say, well, I'm healthy, but now I need to go to the doctor. You know, kids need to do that for checkups. But, but the main point of this is that who needs the doctor normally? Someone who's sick, right? Who needs the Savior? Someone who's a sinner. Now, the problem was the Pharisees didn't think that included them. They thought they were so great. And the reminder for us is, you know, who needs Jesus? Everybody does. We're all sinners. Uh, So really, if you think about it, every time we eat with anyone, we're eating with sinners. But hopefully this lets us see people in a different way. You know, is there people that we sort of see as a lost cause? Is there people that we see as an outsider? Jesus took the opportunity to serve people in those situations. And thank God he did. In fact, that's our, our first main point. Eating with sinners shows God's love for us, right? Because that's, that's what Jesus did. And, and it's not just the process of eating with someone, but it's getting into their lives. Jesus did that. He got into the lives of his disciples, like Matthew. He got into the lives of those tax collectors and sinners. Why did he do this? Again, not to swap stealing or sinning stories. He did it to point them to who he was as the Savior, And thank God that Jesus gets in the lives of sinners because that's how he's become a part of our lives, right? Even if we've been a Christian, what we think of for our whole life, that was God's doing. You know, when when there's a a baby or someone older who is baptized, that's a miracle happening. That's not just water touching someone. God promises that he's at work in that baptism. The Holy Spirit either puts new faith in someone like a baby's heart, or if someone's already a believer, he strengthens faith through that baptism, right? God came to save sinners, right? And he showed that in in how he was eating with sinners. And so then we think of how Jesus did that for us, and hopefully it makes us think of how we want to serve people in our lives. Now, we can serve people in lots of different ways, and, and a lot of those kind of don't require us to get especially close to people. And, and that's okay. You know, those, those aren't bad things. Uh, you know, for example, when, when we give an offering with the idea that, well, part of our offering goes to, uh, for example, world missions so that people around the world can hear about their Savior. That's, that's awesome. Or you think of giving an offering to help someone who is, who is poor or who needs, needs assistance in some way. What a great way to help them by, by giving money toward that. But... The main thing that Jesus is focusing us on today, not that those ways are bad, but what about ways that actually get into people's lives? You know, what about ways that that can show ways to serve people that is more closer, you know, and that is the idea of opening our life to someone? Because that's that's the other point uh, of eating with sinners. Eating with sinners shows our love for God and others. That's the way for us then to respond to how Jesus loved us. And again, it's not necessarily just the actual act of sharing a meal with with a group of people, Um, but it's thinking, how can I find someone in my life to get to know and to hopefully be a reflection of Jesus' love for me? Again, you think of what I mentioned before about someone coming into a lunchroom. Uh, People can feel that way coming into a church. And maybe if, if, if you're someone who's, who's used to going to church, you, it, it's easy for us to sort of forget that, you know, or, or I think about me, well, I work here, you know, I'm, it's not weird for me to walk into a church, right? But, but for some people, you know, maybe they have something in, in the past where they were, they were, had a bad experience uh, with the church, or they haven't been there in a long time, and so maybe there's this thought that they feel, they feel guilty about it, and so even walking into the building, they're already uncomfortable, and then, you know, they go to sit down, uh, not necessarily this part in the, in the pews, but, you know, who do I talk to in a church? And you feel like you're back in the lunchroom holding your tray and looking at people and feeling really, you know, uncomfortable. That can be an opportunity for people who, who it isn't new for to think, how can I be welcoming to someone else in that situation? How can I invite them? Uh, and, and maybe there is a chance for you know, uh, refreshments after church to, to talk to someone and to, to want to find out more about them. Or it could also be when we're not in church, right? When we see people that there's a chance to get to know better, 
Not, and we might think, well, I don't need friends. I already know people. Right, but see people how Jesus saw people. Right, see people, is this someone who needs to know what I know? Is, is there someone who needs that same Savior who, by a miracle, chose me to believe in him? Might there be someone that I could get to know and show that same love to? That's really the opportunity God gives us in our lives. And we see him encouraging that uh, as our text goes on, the, the very last verse, as he's, t- he's talking to these Pharisees who are like, you know, you shouldn't be doing this, Jesus. But Jesus says to them, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So Jesus brought up this, this quote here. You know, he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Jesus was quoting from the Old Testament. It's actually the book of Hosea uh, at this point. But, you know, what, what is the point of that? I desire mercy, not sacrifice. See, back, back at the time that quote was written, there was people who said, hey, God, we're serving you. We're, going through this, we're doing the sacrifices just like you commanded us to. And in the Old Testament, that is how God had people worship him. They did sacrifices. And the people were saying, God, you should be happy with us. We're doing all the sacrifices just like we're supposed to. We're going through all the right motions. And God said to them, uh, okay, you're doing the sacrifices, but you don't care about anyone but yourself. You're, you're going through the motions, but you're not actually showing my love to other people. You're not showing mercy to people who need it. And so that was the point where God said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And we can get into that attitude too, where we just think, you know, other people, that's not my problem, right? I'm, I'll, I'll show up in church, I'll do what I'm supposed to do, whatever. But Jesus remembers, I desire mercy. He desires us to show love to people just like Jesus showed love to us. And like Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, I suppose the, almost the joke of this is that without Jesus, no one's righteous. Those Pharisees who thought they were so great, they weren't righteous on their own. Even those of us here, if, even if you say, well, I've been a church member my whole life, on our own, we're not righteous. We needed Jesus to make us righteous by his life, his death, his resurrection. His blood covers us so that we can stand in heaven as, and even stand today as God's forgiven child. But recognize that when we were sinners, Jesus showed that love for us. And what opportunities are there in your life to find sinners, right? To find fellow sinners like us who also need to hear God's love. What a blessing. What a privilege when God gives us the opportunity to do, to do that. So that's the reminder today is to look for those opportunities. Look for those chances God gives us of eating with sinners. Again, it doesn't actually have to be a meal. But the point is, how can we open our lives? How can we have a God-lived life of service to others, even in those situations that, and I recognize this might not be our comfort zone. It's not necessarily my comfort zone sometimes. But what an opportunity to be able to show the love that Jesus showed us to others. Because, again, that's what Jesus did for us. Like I showed the kids, um, he's willing to wash the feet of his disciples. He's willing to show his love to sinners who don't deserve it, sinners like you and me. And because of what he did, let's show that same love, let's reflect that love to others. Amen. At this time, then, I invite you to please stand. And we'll sing our praise to God uh, as we join in singing in unison the song, You Are God, We Praise You.
You may be seated. We'll continue at this time with the offering. Uh, also, uh, at this time, we invite you to fill out the Connect card, if you haven't done so, that you find in each row. Also, those viewing us online can fill out the online Connect card also. Thank you. I invite you to please stand. In the morning, O oh Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Grant, O merciful Lord, to your faithful people pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Praise 
The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord's face ever shine upon you. The Lord grant you peace for all your days. Amen. We'll conclude our service with one last hymn. You may be seated for this hymn. Once again, good morning and welcome to Good Shepherd. Uh, it's great to be with you here today to praise our God together uh, and receive his gifts to us in his word. Uh, special thanks to our, our handbell uh, choir for playing throughout before and during the service. Also thanks to our, our fifth and sixth graders for singing uh, and for the direction and their families. So thankful to have you with us here today. A um, couple of quick announcements. Our Good Shepherd uh, Faith Nights is... Wednesday, uh, as, it, as it has been, uh, the meal at, is at 5.30, or Eating with Sinners at 5.30. I think I want to start calling all our meals that. Uh, eating with Sinners at 5.30, and then Bible Study for All Ages at 6. Um, and uh, we have an announcement about trunk or treats, I think, right now. There we go. Um. We'll be inviting sinners into our figurative lunchroom uh, on October 29th uh, from 2 to 5 p.m. So it's a Saturday, uh, three weeks from now, three weeks from yesterday. Um, we, last year we had over 1,200 people here, and we already have uh, over 300 registered, and it really ramps up as we get closer, and then there's walk-ins and everything. So we have lots of people coming. If you are interested in coming and attending and bringing your kids along, um, there's a lot of QR codes on posters and things out in the uh, entryway area. Uh, or you can find us on Facebook. We have an event and you can register there. Uh, skip the wait in the lines and, and get pre-registered. Um, also, uh, we need your help too if you're able to help that day. So hosting a trunk, um, helping with registration, being a, a guide for people who have questions. We have lots of jobs that we need filled, and we need lots and lots of candy. 
lots of candy. So there's a bin out in the entryway as well. Um, thank you. I saw like three, four people this morning drop off candy, which is awesome. So I really appreciate that. But we can always use more. So if you're able to help with that, that'd be great. And then there's also uh, a table out there with sign-ups. Uh, you can just write your name in if you're able to help that day too. We, we really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Another quick announcement uh, from Josh here. Hi, this is, I'm Josh. This is Brian. We're uh, the leaders in the Pioneer Group. We just had a little special announcement. We wanted to recognize someone who has helped the Pioneer Program since 1992. Can we have Rick come up here? Rick, can you come up here, please? He doesn't know we're doing this. We're surprising him. <laughs> Rick has helped the Pioneer Program since 1992. <clears throat> we had a little plaque that we had made here for Rick, and then we have a little slide up on the, on the TV screen. So there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, there is refreshments available, so you're all welcome to join us uh, for that. More Eating with Sinners time. Uh, get to know someone. Look, look for someone that you don't know super well. That's a great, great thing to do with that. Thanks, God's blessings, and we'll see you again.